Hello everyone, I'm back with chapter seven. Uh, today we're gonna be covering the presidency. There's only 10 slides, so hopefully this will go by relatively quickly. Um, let's just go ahead and jump right in. The qualifications to becoming the president, um, natural born citizen, at least 35 years old, and then needs to be a resident for 14 plus years. So although they may be a natural born citizen, if they're going and doing work or in another country, they're required to be here, have lived here for 14 plus years, just so that way um, the president is aware of the political climate, the issues facing America, specifically within current modern issues. Um, other qualifications include maximum of two four year terms. So this was a precedent sent uh, set by Washington. So it's important to recognize this isn't a mandated uh, qualification yet. Right now it is a set precedent by Washington to convey that there's not gonna be any constitutional monarchy or reelected tyrant. So the reason that he set this precedent was because they had just uh, declared independence from Great Britain and just keep in mind, remember Great Britain had a monarchy and that's really where they were suppressing them of religious freedom, um, their rights as an individual representation. So they didn't want those issues to occur again. So that's why Washington set the precedent of having the two four year terms. Yes, okay. Um, now, one exception to this was Roosevelt who had served uh, through four elections during the Great Depression and World War II. So there was a lot of um, political and current issues facing um, the nation during this time. And because it was a president, he could technically still do it. It was just kind of like a tradition set by Washington. And so because he served four election terms, this led to once he was out of office, the ratification of the 22nd Amendment uh, which constitutionally now it's within the constitution that says that the president can only serve up to two four year terms. Um, a VP, if a VP were to step into the role of the president, so if the president were to die in the middle of his term, um, resign issues like that where he steps down as his position, then um, the VP will step into that role. And so then they can serve up to 10 years two years filling in for um, the president that has just stepped down from their position and then the two full uh, terms, if reelected, obviously. Um, vice president and role of impeachment. So initially the vice president's role was just to stand in for the president in the case that there was an emergency and the president wasn't able to fulfill his role. Um, but that really wasn't enough of a reason for someone having so much power over individuals in a nation. They decided to also give him the role of presiding officer for the Senate. So uh, like we talked about in our last chapter um, with Congress, the presiding officer for the Senate is in charge of voting on an issue in the case that there's a tie um, within the House. And so the reason that they had the vice president do this instead of um, members of Congress that are senators is so that way no state is lacking representation and no state has an advantage over another. So they want to make sure that each state is um, represented fairly and equally. Let's see. Um, sorry. <laughs> Next we have impeachment, which is the process of removing government officials from office. So currently that's what we're seeing right now happening um, with our former president, Donald Trump. Um, he's being um, impeached for insurrection. So that is something that we're seeing right now. Uh, next thing, Congress has the constitutional power to give charge to civil leaders of high crimes. Okay, so with the impeachment process, uh, the House of Representatives is in charge of charging um, any civil leader, whether that be the president, vice president, federal judges of any high crimes or misdemean um, high crimes or misdemeanors. Yes, and in order for them to be charged by the House of Representatives, it needs a majority vote. Now, once that gets a majority vote, it then moves on to the Senate. And there in the Senate, um, they will give him a fair, or him currently, because we've only had male presidents, but um, in the future we may have some. So 
um, civil leaders, they're going to charge, the Senate will charge them for their crimes. So they're gonna have a full trial for them um, and then kind of lay out the court process. And so then if the Senate um, votes two thirds majority uh, to impeach a civil leader, then they are officially impeached and removed from office. Um, their removal of office in the form of impeachment also says that they cannot be reelected into um, federal positions of power. So that's something important to also keep in mind. Roles of secession. So in 1974, we have the Presidential Secession Act, which basically just lists out the line or like the chain of command that we follow in the case that the president can no longer be the president. Um, so here you'll see we have vice president and then it goes, if the vice president can't do it, then it becomes the House of Speaker, so forth and so on. The 25th Amendment that says, um, if a vacancy were to occur in the vice president's position, then the president must nominate um, someone to fill in that position. However, it needs to be approved by the majority of both houses in Congress. Um, the 25th Amendment also states that the vice president and, and their cabinet can deem a president unable to fulfill their duties if there's um, question of cognitive abilities, illness, um, or in the case that a president uh, themselves relinquishes their power. So that is something else to keep in mind, which is super interesting that I wasn't aware of. All right, constitutional powers of the president. Here you'll see I put article two. Uh, that just tells you where these powers are located in the constitution. So all of these powers are listed in article two of the constitution. Um, some of the powers include um, appointing, so the president has the authority to appoint advisors to their administration with approval of the Senate. So the Senate must approve uh, those that the president is putting into power. Uh, they also have the ability to remove appointees at their own discretion. Um, let's see what else we have. Many presidential cabinets, um, cabinet members are based off of character. Yes, so it's based off of your character and then the, pre the president's efforts um, to make his cabinet more diverse. So oftentimes, especially we've seen um, with our new president, Biden, is he, his goal is to make it as diverse as possible, his cabinet, by electing um, Native American leaders to uh, delegate issues regarding Native Americans or it, including um, Black men and women into positions of power. So definitely uplifting uh, minority groups and giving them a place where their voices can be heard. That is definitely something that a president keeps in mind when, or should keep in mind when they're choosing their cabinet. And also based off of character, because this is gonna relay um, what, what and who is extremely important to the president. I also have here, it says made up of 15 plus departments. So the cabinet is technically an informal organization put together by the president. Um, but they definitely hold a place of power, and we see that even now. Um, the president has the ability to elect temporary appointees without congressional approval in the case that Congress is in a formal uh, recess for 10 plus days. So in the case that Congress is in the middle of a trial or is in a formal recess for 10 or more days, um, the president has the ability to appoint someone without congressional approval. Um, that's it for appointing powers. For convene Congress is another power that the president has the luxury of having. Uh, that requires, so there's a requirement and then there's like um, an additional uh, incentive. So it requires that the president has to inform Congress periodically about basically the state of the union. How are we doing? And then that's also, that's also where we see the state of the union address coming from. Um, another, uh, privilege, I guess you could say, of the constitutional powers given to the president is um, they can actually assemble either one or both of houses of Congress um, in extraordinary situations or circumstances. So one of them may have been um, COVID. So if COVID was coming, uh, that could definitely be an extraordinary 
uh, circumstance or occasion that Congress may have needed to um, assemble for. Uh, another constitutional power the president has is making treaties. The president can make treaties. However, um, two thirds of the Senate must approve it. The president also has the power to receive amb ambassadors. So basically um, legitimize, validate um, the existence of other nations. Um, the Senate can also require substantial amendments to the treaty before approving them. So the president can't just make a treaty and um, Senate either say yay or nay to it, they can definitely propose amendments to it. So that way he, um, they can further um, the signing of the treaty, more um, support. Um, the president can also unsign treaties. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, congressional fast track authority. So this is still also under treaties. Uh, this protects the president's authority to negotiate trade agreements without Congress altering the accord. So basically prevents uh, Congress from trying to implement amendments. Uh, this definitely requires from Congress an up or down vote. So um, that Congress instead of like proposing amendments or um, different things being tweaked within the trade agreements, this is either they totally agree for they're on board with it or they're not. So if you see an up or down vote, that's the same as saying yay or nay vote by Congress. Executive agreements. Uh, this allows the president to form secret and highly sensitive uh, arrangements with foreign nations without the consent of the Senate. This does not at all require the Senate's approval. Um, so that's definitely something interesting because it seems to contradict um, Senate needing to approve two, uh, two thirds of Senate approving a treaty. All right, next, veto power. The president holds the ability to veto any bills that were passed by both houses of Congress. However, Congress can then override that veto if they receive two thirds vote in each of the houses, which is very difficult to do, um, but they definitely have the ability to override a presidential veto. Um, president Grant proposed there be a constitutional amendment known as the line item veto, which gave the president the authority to delete any parts of a bill that involved um, taxing or spending, but that was later um, revoked as unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. So it definitely, like everyone was like, oh yeah, sounds good, like we're on board. And then um, of course, instances occurred where a president, like I think it was Clinton and New York City um, Supreme Court where uh, Clinton tried to remove funding that Congress had given to this um, to the state of New York, um, and he was able to do this with the line item veto, and so then they went to the Supreme Court, and then it was deemed unconstitutional, kind of uh, beyond the scope of presidential power and abilities. So then that's when it was revoked. Um, let's see. Next we have the president's ability to preside over the military. So technically in the constitution, the president is the commander in chief of both the army and the Navy. Um, but Congress also technically has the power to declare war. So there's kind of like this um, unclear boundary between Congress and presidential powers in regards to war. So that is also known as the commander in chief clause, which where the president would use that clause to justify them sending troops out into war without Congress actually declaring war. Um, so then that led to the war power resolutions uh, that was enacted by Congress that limits the president's authority to send troops to foreign hostile lands, uh, lands without constitutional approval. So obviously that, um, that unclear boundary uh, made it difficult for Congress and the president to uh, agree on their limits of power. So then that's where this war power resolution came into play. However, um, in the case of 9-11, we saw the approval of the joint resolution, which gave the president more open-ended authority to wage war. So you can see the progression of uh, the presidential's powers over presiding the military. 
over time. Next, we have pardoning power. So this is the power to release individuals or groups from punishment or legal consequence of a crime before and after conviction. Um, it restores their rights and privileges as citizens. So also note, it says impeachment cannot be pardoned. So for example, Nixon was uh, charged with impeachment. However, he resigned before it went into trials with the Senate. So the president that followed after him had given pardon to Nixon because um, he didn't fulfill the impeachment process. Um, keep in mind, Nixon was with the uh, Nixon tapes and the Watergate scandal. So um, the president had given him pardon. This can get quite controversial depending on the ish, um, the the um, punish, I guess the act that an individual or group were to perform because um, of course the presidential's um, actions are of course up for criticism here in the United States. So that's something to keep in mind, especially when they're wanting to get reelected. Um, expanding presidential powers. So kind of like going on farther beyond the scope of what is specifically stated in um, the constitution about uh, presidential powers. Um, Washington had set precedents for the fall, um, for the presidents to follow. <laughs> so we have, he established the primacy of the national government with the Whiskey Rebellion. So kind of saying similar to the supremacy clause uh, that the national government trumps any other government. Then we have the establishment of um, a cabinet system, uh, conduct foreign affairs and get Senate's approval on treaties, example, Jay's treaty. Um, inherent powers. This is powers that are inferred by the Constitution, kind of the definition of expanding presidential powers. What is the responsibility of the president based on your inferences um, and readings of the Constitution? So he had said declaring neutrality and conducting diplomatic relations. Um, let me see this one time. I don't want it to be in the way. There you go. Um, presidential establishment. Uh, so we're just going to go through each of these different kind of departments that make up the president's, um, the executive branch. So vice president, this is a position used often when electing um, a party into office. They'll use the vice president as almost a balance to balance out the ticket. So for example, um, when Obama was going into office, people were kind of hesitant on his own foreign, uh, his knowledge on foreign affairs and foreign policy. So uh, Joe Biden was added as the VP in order to kind of balance out and reassure um, the American people that there's someone in power who has um, those qualifications or those characteristics that the president is often lacking. Um, they also, Okay, so also the powers given to the vice president is regulated by the is regulated by the president. So depending on their responsibilities, it's up to how much the president is willing to allow them to do. Um, cabinet. Uh, the cabinet helps the president execute laws and assist them in decision making. So this was created, this created the need for greater government responsibilities through programs and aid. So within the cabinet, there are people who uh, specialize in specific um, issues, topics, um, challenges facing America. So that puts a lot more responsibility on the executive branch to um, provide solutions, uh, improvements to programs and aids to the American citizens. Then we have the first lady. I also put slash gentlemen because hopefully in the future we will have a female president on their way, that would be super awesome. Uh, their job is to be an informal advisor to the president. So oftentimes we'll see the first lady's influence on issues and policies regarding, um, issues and policies regarding what the president is enacting. Um, also, they're responsible for um, making public contributions. So oftentimes we'll see different presidents, uh, presidential first, first lady, gentlemen, uh, taking on a specific role. So uh, with Michelle Obama, she took on eating healthy, uh, making 
uh, fit choices, uh, things of that matter, speaking at schools, uh, adjusting school lunches and nutritional uh, information, things of that sort. Then we have the executive office of the president. And this is an advisory that works with policy making agencies to advance the president's policy preferences by utilizing their expertise in special interests. So pretty similar to a cabinet. Um, yes, White House staff. So they basically just work on making sure that the executive branch is running smoothly with people like policy strategists, uh, communication staff, White House counsels, and then liaisons that speak between Congress and the president, kind of just making sure that everything really runs smoothly. smoothly. Um, presidential leadership and the importance of public opinion. One of my personal favorites, um, the term going public. So if you hear that oftentimes, this is when the president bypasses the um, need to have approval from the heads of Congress and kind of just goes directly to the people. Uh, they are out speaking at public events, on TV shows, uh, radio stations, kind of just creating that more, that closer connection and relationship with the American people. And this is often done because when a president has the citizens approval and um, I guess their approval, then it's going to put a lot more pressure on other elected officials to fulfill the demands of the people. So this is a great tactic that a lot of people have taken on. I believe Bill Clinton did it. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it was Bill Clinton. And then for sure we did see that happening um, with uh, President Obama. Uh, so like we said, presidents seek high approval rates from the people because high levels of support allow the president to also push more controversial legislation because they've already gained the support of the people. So that is super duper interesting to keep in mind, especially in such a divided nation, having more um, support is gonna allow them to push more controversial um, legislation on their end of the spectrum, whether that be pushing more um, leftist legislation or more right-wing legislation. Um, having that support is going to definitely persuade and put a lot more pressure onto uh, elected officials, whether that be in Congress, um, whether that be in the legislation, uh, legislative branch, wherever that may be, that puts a lot more pressure on them to fulfill the demands of the people. Uh, super interesting thing to keep in mind. All right, this is our last slide. I hope that this was super quick. I have no clue about the times until <laughs> I'm done, but let's just hop in. Last slide, I promise. President as policy maker. Um, so originally the president's job wasn't necessarily to implement policy, but over time as they became more vocal on specific issues that they were in support of or things they wanted to resolve, we started to see the president push more laws and bills uh, that they wanted to see implemented during their time in office. So let's see, um, we said, the executive branch has come to propose laws through implementing their goals in the budget plan and for their time in office. So it can be extremely difficult to pass programs in Congress. So that's why it's so very important that the president has a timeline, a set agenda that specifically states what it is they're wanting to accomplish. This is why we saw uh, so much uh, health care reform during President Obama's um, Year, uh, years in office because it was, it, he explicitly stated it at the beginning um, within his budget plan, agendas, um, announcements. He made that the center of his um, campaign. And so with having that at the forefront, it was easier for him within his first year to go ahead and get these um, laws and programs implemented. Um, speaking of getting them implemented within the first few years, uh, many presidents will will need to accomplish many of their projected um, laws within the first few years because there's this almost honeymoon period is what they call it where the president and Congress kind of give that more like less of a challenge 
towards the president wanting to implement policies. So it's really, you'll see a lot being done within the first few years of a president coming into office. Um, speaking of, I'm gonna take a quick little water break, uh, grab some water, give you a second to kind of just digest that. <laughs> I never realized how much talking a teacher has to do until I did this. I, I absolutely love it though, and I'm so happy. So many of you guys um, found this helpful. It's really encouraging. Um, sorry. All right, let's go ahead and jump back in. Budget and legislative implementation. So the Office of Management and Budget, that's also known as OMB, this is um, the office that prepares the presidential's annual budget proposals. They look over them. <clears throat> they review programs and executive departments. Uh, they provide economic forecasts very much into the very uh, knit, what do they call it? Like uh, nitty gritty, very specifics of the budget proposal. Um, yes, and they look at, they analyze the proposed budgets and the bills agency rules. Um, one thing that I really want you to take away from this is when you're looking at a president's budget plan, funding is a direct correlation to its level of importance to the president. Um, so when you're looking at things like Obama's um, policies, he implemented healthcare was the number one priority because that was the mo most money going into those programs. So that's something you wanna definitely keep in mind when looking at um, different presidential uh, civil leaders, officials. Um, tools of presidential power, executive orders. I'm sure you've heard this many times um, that a president ordered executive orders. Um, this is basically rules or regulations set forth by the president um, that have the same effect as a law, but do not require president uh, congressional approval. Um, so a lot of those can definitely, it's definitely interesting. Um, to keep in mind. Then we have uh, presidential directives, which is an executive order that is issued by the president with the advice and counsel of the national security system. So this one is definitely similar to the executive order, but we're seeing it being kind of um, pushed and persuaded by the national security council. And then with some of these presidential directives, we'll also see signing statements, which are basically written comments um, that express any hesitation, fears, um, or critiques that a president may have when signing these bills that are being pushed um, by the National Security Council. So they may sign it and still have um, their hesitations. And so they'll attach that there. Um, the reason that it's, it's, it's important that they're doing that or including signing statements is because it's going to definitely delay policy implementation and invite litigation because then that's gonna take a second round of looking like why is the president concerned about this or why do they deem it unconstitutional? Um, so it definitely is interesting to see. Um, this is it. That's all I have for the um, chapter seven presidency uh, notes. I'm definitely going to keep going. I hope that this is helpful. Uh, thank you so much. If you've made it this far, um, go ahead and subscribe because I will be, or put the little notification bells on because I will be posting these hopefully for the rest of our chapters that we have due. Um, thank you guys so much. Um, I think that is it. I'm still getting the hang of ending this. All right. I found it. All right. Thank you guys so much. I hope this was helpful.